Thank you very much, Annika, for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak here today. Indeed, I'm going to tell you about some recent research that we did, McKinsey Denmark did, together with the Innovation Fund of Denmark. And what prompted us to look at gender diversity was really two things. First of all, we see large gender imbalances in fields such as science, technology, engineering, and math, or the so-called STEM fields. And second of all, we see sustained low female representation in leadership. And this is doubly problematic, really, because STEM technology is becoming increasingly important. And so these are actually also the areas that feed into the leadership pipeline of the future. So a little bit of background on the project, first of all. At McKinsey, we've been doing research on gender diversity for over 10 years, so really providing a fact base for the global dialogue. But this is actually the first time that we've put this research into a distinct country context. And so we really wanted to go one level deeper and understand uh, the career choices of men and women at an individual level. So what we actually did was pull data on more than 50,000 STEM graduates. We indeed used STEM as a, as a case study and track these individuals throughout their careers to really understand that the choices that they, that they were making. And as I said, we had as our focus areas STEM and leadership, and I'll come back to those. First, I want to mention also that we were fortunate enough to work together with a number of research organizations who actually work with this on a daily basis. So first of all, our leading universities, the Technical University of Denmark, Copenhagen Business School, etc., but also organizations that actually study gender diversity on a day-to-day -day basis. Quinfo is one, university is another. And all of this work resulted in what you see there on the right, which is a report called Bridging the Talent Gap in Denmark, Insights from Female Representation and STEM. And this was launched October 1st at a large conference in Copenhagen. And we will make sure that you all get the link so you can also go back and, and read it afterwards. So looking first of all on le at leadership, as, as I said earlier, we've already heard a lot about the numbers here, the re most recent ones are, um, and we have looked at Denmark, of course, but also the peers that we like to, uh, to compare ourselves to. And what we really saw and what prompted us to look at this was the fact that female representation is low and across all sectors. So both private, public and academic, we see very low female representation. If you look at executive committees, only one in seven is a woman today. Senior government officials, one in four. And worryingly also, we saw that Denmark is actually behind most of our Nordic peers. Of course, uh, some of those numbers are also low, but this was really sort of the starting point for wanting to support uh, the dialogue and further action on this topic. As we heard earlier, one of the sort of most well-studied and most well-recognized benefits of diversity, not just gender diversity, but diversity broadly, is uh, diversity of thought. So diverse teams are more creative, more innovative. And sort of to show you a very concrete example of this playing out in practice, we at McKinsey have what we call an organizational health index, which we actually use to measure the organizational health of different organizations on different outcomes that you see here on the right, such as a clear sense of direction for the company, highly motivated employees, et cetera, et cetera. And these outcomes are driven by underlying leadership behaviors. And here, if you look at the left, we've actually seen from studying a number of different companies all over the world that men and women tend to apply different leadership behaviors. They tend to have different traits. Women are a little bit more participative in their decision making. Men tend to be more individualistic. And of course, this is not black and white, but we do see a, see a pattern there. And so what we then interestingly found, if you go back on the right to the, to the outcomes in terms of organizational health, was that companies with three or more women on their executive committees actually turned out healthier on average on all of these outcomes. So not just on the ones that are driven by female leadership behaviors, but actually on all of them. So that tells us that this is really not about just getting more women and improving on those certain leadership traits that they drive. It's about diversity, and this actually has a positive impact all around. Then looking at STEM, um, as I said, we uh, drew data on 50,000 individuals, both from LinkedIn and also from the National Bureau of Statistics in Denmark, which has a very rich uh, data set. We then chose selected cohorts and basically attract them throughout their careers. And we supplemented this quantitative data with a lot of qualitative research. So we had focus groups with STEM women. We did a lot of company and also public sector interviews. And we had this expert panel that you also saw in the beginning that provided ad advice um, on the way. 
more so, we also really wanted to go deep on the academic research. There is so much uh, research going on on this topic, and there is, we looked at essentially the worldwide view on, uh, on how, what the latest findings are and how this could bolster our analyses. What came out and what we used sort of as a structure for the report were these four, what we call critical career moments. So first of all, and again, we're looking at STEM here as a specific case study, but I'll come back to how we can actually generalize the insights into other areas as well. First of all, we need to inspire the young women into choosing a STEM education. Second of all, we then need to attract these STEM graduates to actually taking STEM jobs. Next, we need to retain them within STEM careers. And finally, we need to advance them into leadership positions. And what I'll do now is just give you a little bit of flavor for the different analyses we did at each of these steps. Um, you can find many more in the report. But what I can say up front, as we've also heard, there is really no silver bullet. And what we found is that you need to act across the whole spectrum at all moments. And you also need multiple actor engagement. Um, and so really talent loss occurs throughout, and you need to address it accordingly. So if we start by the inspiring moment, getting more young women interested in STEM. Here, there are both positive and negative uh, influential factors at play. As we already heard, stereotypes are really pervasive and from a very early age. There was a study done in the US, it's actually been done consistently through the 1960s, where five-year-old kids were asked to draw a scientist. And the word scientist in English is neutral, right? In Danish, it's actually Wienskabsmen, which has man at the end of it, but in English, it is a neutral word. And uh, 95% of the boys draw a man to this day, they have always done so, and about 60% of the girls still do so as well. Um, and what we actually also see is that this share increases over time, so the kids get more and more culturally conditioned to seeing men in these roles. And if you think of an astronaut, if you think of a scientist or an engineer, I bet you most of you will, will picture a man as well. So these sort of dictate what girls can be and cannot be. And because we're all influenced by stereotypes and bias, parents are as well, of course. And studies find that actually, because parents are influenced by these stereotypes, they hold lower expectations for their daughters than their sons' performance in subjects such as math and science. And this, in turn, then has a detrimental impact on their actual performance, so driving them further away from these fields. Finally, toys. I would like to highlight toys. Um, I'm sure you can all picture the toy stores, the blue universe where you can play with action men and building blocks and construction sets, and the pink where you can play with dolls and cook and put on makeup, etc., etc. And this actually has an impact uh, from a very early age. Studies even show that playing with construction sets actually develops the spatial capabilities in, in kids, and this then promotes later in life success in, in engineering if this is what they, what they choose to study. Fortunately, there are also a number of positive influences, and these center around role models. We've already heard the importance of this, but we want to stress it even more that this cannot be stressed enough, basically, and we need to, uh, to ensure this from a very early age. So toys again, toy companies have actually started to address these. You may have heard of robotic engineer Barbie. Um, the example I've mentioned here is Lego, who has recently released minifigures, the famous minifigures, uh, in the shapes of NASA scientists and astronauts, so really allowing girls from a young age to see that this is and playing with a very tangible image of, of what they could become as well. Friends, tremendously important. We see universities and also NGOs organize what we call coding camps, so allowing young girls to also see that coding is not just young boys sitting in a basement. Um, it can also be a really fun activity to share with your friends. And as I said, parents are uh, very, in, very influential, obviously, also as gatekeepers to toys, right? Um, and they should encourage their daughters as well to look beyond uh, the stereotypes. And then interestingly, on teachers, we also see a positive correlation between the exposure to female teachers and the performance of, of girls in science and math. And interestingly, there is no correlation for the boys. So there, it doesn't matter the gender of the teacher, they do equally well. But for the girls, it really has an effect. Moving on a little bit more on inspiring and also uh, moving into attracting. So what we saw is, back to the bias question, that very subtle signals can actually have a market effect. So what you see here on the left is the share of women in different uh, educational programs at the Technical University of Denmark. And what we saw, and also actually confirmed with the university that they saw and that they even think in when they describe and name new programs, is actually that certain words tend to appear and tend to appeal more to women. 
These are words such as bio, human life, science, environment, design, and there you indeed see many more women than you do in the last ones where no such words are mentioned. And this is anecdotal evidence, of course, but nonetheless, the university actually confirmed that they are thinking about this and the very sort of implicit communicative signals uh, involved in this. Also, at the application stage, a lot of organizations today use what is called blinding. So this is to try and mitigate the impact of bias by removing all gender-related cues. So name and picture, of course, but also um, associations such as being a soccer coach on the side, which would make you think of a man, or being in a parent-teacher association, which, which would make you think of a woman. So really sort of eliminating and making it as neutral as possible. And this was actually conceived, interestingly, back in the 70s by symphony orchestras in the United States who saw very, very low shares of women. Um, and so they, what they did was actually place a physical screen in front of the auditioning musician and a carpet on the floor so you couldn't hear it if the woman was wearing heels. And they saw a massive effect. Um, today, the symphony orchestras in the US that use this have about 40% women. And we even see that symphony orchestras, some in Europe, don't use it yet and have low shares of women still. So this was sort of where the technique um, was conceived and now a lot of organizations use it with, uh, with great success. Then back to the pipeline. Um, so looking at our STEM graduates, how many, what are the, what's the share of women versus men that are attracted to STEM jobs, retained and also advance into leadership roles? So encouragingly, first of all, the attraction rates weren't actually that different. And actually, these results were confirmed both by our LinkedIn data and our statistics Denmark data. So we're quite confident that this is actually a general picture that we can trust. So if we look at the attracting moment first, the difference there, so the 81% uh, sorry, of the female graduates that take STEM jobs and the 85% of men, the difference is statistically significant, but still very small. Um, and if we move on to the retention moment, the difference is actually not statistically significant. So that's really good news in the sense that this also tells us that women basically come back from maternity leave, they remain affiliated with STEM and with, uh, with STEM jobs. Where the massive differences then reveal themselves, and this is back to the chart in the beginning with, uh, with the share of women in different leadership roles, is indeed in management. And here we've actually split it uh, into public and private sector, so the STEM graduates working in public versus private sector. And the reason we've done this is because we see more women choosing public sector. So the share of women relative to men, STEM, within public sector is greater. And and here we actually see that the relative difference in the share of women and men in the public sector is much bigger than in private. So that tells us a little bit about that this is not just about fixing the pipeline. It's not just about getting more women in, because we already have that in public sector. There are other more subtle back to, uh, back to bias um, influences at play. So. All of this led us, as I already alluded to earlier, uh, to a series of recommendations, and these really go across all of these moments, and they are also addressed at multiple different actors. Um, we divided them into three groups. So first of all, parents, educational institutions, and communities, which are very important uh, from an early age for the girls. Then the workplace, and finally, government and broader society. So let me quickly run through them by one by one. We've already had a couple of examples. The first one is all about role models. And this one could really go all across the matrix because it is so important. But we put it here because, uh, as I said earlier, this is super, super important from a ve very early age. That is where boys and girls get cult culturally conditioned, uh, wired really, to think about gender roles in these ways. The next one is about communication. So an example of that was the program titles that I showed you earlier with the, with the words. So very explicit communication there. But actually implicit factors matter as well. There were studies done about the physical environment and the impact that has on women. So in the US, they took two groups of women and put one in a computer science classroom, sort of the classic Star Trek posters on the walls, soda cans and cables scattered about. And the other one, bright and airy, water bottles, plants, and the girls in that other classroom afterwards expressed a much greater interest in actually studying computer science. So very sort of really subtle signals that communicate uh, what the girls should choose, very important. Moving on to the workplace, um, we already heard a couple of comments on that, and indeed we can confirm that what we see as the overarching and vastly most important uh, factor there is commitment from the top. So you need to make this a business priority, and like any other business priority, there needs to be targets behind, there needs to be tracking, accountability, etc. 
and we also see successful companies making their own business case, so really sort of explaining why this is important for that particular company. And you can read a couple of, uh, of examples of that in the report. Moving on then specifically to the attracting moment in the workplace. Here, first of all, it's about reducing bias. And I showed you earlier the blinding method. Also, when you get to interviews, you can sort of use a very structured approach, which not eliminates, but at least reduces the impact of bias. We have some concrete recommendations on that. Then on retention, um, it's very much about creating an inclusive work culture. And what does that mean? Well, it centers a lot about flexibility, because when women come back from maternity leave, they may need more flexible hours to go part-time for a while. And this needs to become a social norm. That ne it needs to become socially accepted. We also see men taking longer uh, leaves of paternity leave, sorry, and this has a tremendous effect as well, because it actually breaks down these stereotypes and makes, makes it the social norm. Finally, on advancement, we see a big impact of uh, mentorship and sponsorship. So we talked a little bit about mentorship earlier, but I would like to highlight sponsorship as well, because they're actually very different. So mentorship, a mentor is basically a career advisor, and it can therefore also be someone from outside of your organization, whereas a sponsor is really has to be within your own organization because it's someone senior, and it's someone who really goes out to bat for you, who takes an active stake in making you successful and recommending you for promotions, etc. So really sort of wanting you to succeed and, and acting accordingly. Finally then, uh, on government and society, I think this is exactly what we're doing here. What we've done in the report uh, is look at different examples, both from the Nordics, but also beyond. Um, and we're very much encouraged to continue this and to also evaluate impact. That's the really hard part with these sort of uh, very large scale experiments, right? Um, but I think we've heard many great examples here today. That is exactly what we think we should do more of. And with that, I thank you very much. <laughs> I think we might have some questions to you, but yeah. uh, when you were uh, uh, bringing the example of uh, toys, then yeah. I actually remembered a study that was done in a way that um, it was a test. So for a group of toddlers, they only gave uh, toys that you, they usually give to the boys. So all the girls, they were playing with cars and, you know, guns and stuff like small boys usually do. And then at the age of four or something, they noticed that the girls took the truck and did this <laughs> with the truck. <laughs> so it's, there are some things that we just can't change that are part of our DNA somehow. You meant, meant help, help them as babies, yes, kind of, sort of them nurturing them. Yes, help them as babies, the... yeah, yeah, so it's, it's really nice. <laughs> right, right, yeah, yeah. A truck baby. <laughs> This is how you repair the tractor. <laughs> oh, yes. that's... Not, not, <laughs> I didn't yeah, know Not that. only physically, but you need to put your soul into it also. Yeah, uh, yeah there's another care. way. Yes. yes. Yeah. That was a very balanced way now. Yes. Okay, does no, anybody... No, I think you're completely right. There is something in that. And I think that's also why those efforts by toy companies to sort of in a sense, stay within the girls' own universes. So create a robotic engineer Barbie and create an astronaut Lego figure. Sort of appeal to them, but in their own language a little bit. I think that's also can be very impactful. Absolutely. Yeah. So anybody, question? Yes, no? It's a rather... Mm. Oh, it looks like it's all clear. <laughs> it's all clear. Is it? We got it. We're going to read some more about it. Okay, Merle. Thank you. Uh, Merle Maigra from an Estonian cybersecurity company. I noted how you repeatedly referred to the importance of role modeling. So uh, uh, somewhere <coughs> at the very beginning you underlined the importance of uh, female leadership role models. I was wondering if you could expand on that a little bit and, and, and explain a little bit longer, uh, more on how, how exactly are some of the ways of doing that of on getting... Danish model, uh, experience. In terms of because there aren't many female leaders today, or um, like, like, well, I, it's up to you to to, to expand. That, but like, how would you um, use the female leadership role modeling yeah. 
to promote the idea of bridging the gap between yeah. the gender. Yeah. yeah, so first of all, I think leadership is many things, right? You don't have to be an executive to be a leader. Um, and so, indeed, these coding camps, for instance, we've seen, especially in the US, there's something called Girls Who Code. And so young peers, sort of 15, 16 years of age, who really sort of take in girls of, of nine and 10 and mentor them, essentially, and show them why this is cool. I mean, they really look up to them as leaders, right? And this goes later as well. Um, in the workplace, it doesn't have to be an exec. It can also be someone you admire. It can be a man that you admire. It doesn't have a, But I think women, essentially, you can sort of think about it from a very early age. Parents are leaders, right? They're super influential. Um, and so I think maybe we also need to think broader about that concept. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much for coming. Thank you. Is it your first or second time in Estonia? In first Thailand? time. First, first time, time. Yeah. again. <laughs> Yeah. This is, uh, Thank this you. is a very I good Nordic integration <laughs> at this event, I would say. And I have a question. How do you feel? Very good. Very Thank good. You. I love Estonia. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.